Hello and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain here with my brother and co-host Rohit Gosain. ESMO 2024 was yet another exciting Congress shortly after World Lung. Though thousands of abstracts were presented here, we've selected four studies to focus in the lung cancer space that should be on our radar as a community oncologist. We'll start off with the LORA trial, then touch on the Mariposa and Mariposa 2 studies, and then close off with Adriatic study. To dissect through these studies and their clinical relevance, we're joined by none other than Dr. Stephen Liu, Associate Professor and Director of Thoracic Oncology at the Georgetown Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. No, thanks for the invitation. Great to always uh, chat with you guys. Well, Stephen, welcome. Uh, let's start off with our first study here, which is in locally advanced unresectable space, the LORA trial, which is questioning the role of osimertinib post-chemo radiation space where surgery is not possible. This was, in fact, one of the plenary sessions up at ASCO 2024, and what we saw here at ESMO 2024 was more from outcomes from CNS standpoint. And based off of this trial itself, this was O.C. Martin was approved on September 25th, 2024. Stephen, can you please walk us through the recent update, what we saw at ESMO 2024? Yeah, there are a couple of things. You know, Laura was a profound benefit when we give osimertinib after chemo radiation. We significantly improve progression-free survival and the hazard ratios that we're seeing are, are profound, nothing like what we're seeing in stage four. And so I think there were a, a few questions after we saw those data uh, once we recovered. And one was really about, you know, where are we having the most impact? When we deliver chemo radiation, we're targeting cancer that we believe is just in the chest, uh, the lung, the lymph nodes. Uh, and so at that point, we don't believe patients have metastatic disease. Once we receive an intervention like osimertinib, are we changing the patterns of relapse? And you know, what we saw is osimertinib, as we know, a very CNS active drug. We saw a significant reduction in CNS progression. The study was designed to sort of uh, monitor those areas with MRI. And I look at these figures in sort of two ways. One is that with standard chemo radiation, we have a very high risk of spread to the brain. You see here at two years, only 43% of patients are CNS progression free. So learning from that one, we should be doing MRIs in our patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer really across stages because this is an area of relapse one we have to be concerned about. And two, with those emergent, we can really prevent that. We see that CNS progression free rate at two years goes from 43% uh, up to 83%. You know, there were some at, at the time that Laura was presented that worried, are we over-treating some people? Giving osimertinib indefinitely, is that too much therapy for patients who may be cured with chemo radiation? And I think what we've learned as time has gone on is we don't cure very many people with an EGFR mutant lung cancer using chemo radiation alone. And the, the rate of being progression-free at these different landmarks is staggeringly low. This really is a disease that spreads pretty quickly. There was also some concern were patients understaged because not everyone got a PET scan. PET scan was recommended, but not mandated. And uh, Professor Shun Liu presented these data at ESMO, did show about half of the people in the study got a PET scan, but the hazard ratios were the same, whether you had a PET scan or not. The landmarks were the same, whether you had a PET or not. PET doesn't explain the profound improvement here. Osimertinib does. Thank you, Stephen. This is indeed now the new standard of care for this subset patient population. As you've touched on, there were a few critiques, be it staging or it is still daunting with the idea of keeping the treatment indefinite. Hopefully, tools like CTDNA and so forth will help us decide who we can maybe stop this treatment early on versus continuing. Okay, while on the topic of EGFR mutations, let's touch on Mariposa study, where we're looking at amivantamab and lizertinib in first line for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. This combination was also approved just before ESMO on August 19, 2024. Stephen, can you touch on the study design and its recent updates on the resistant patterns that we're seeing? Sure. So Mariposa, a frontline study for patients with common sensitizing EGFR mutations. So your exon 19 deletions, your LA5 at our point mutations, and here randomized to three arms. Uh, one, the experimental arm would be the combination of amivantamab, the EGFR met by a specific antibody, uh, plus lazertinib, which is another third generation TKI, pretty comparable to osimertinib. Uh, the second arm was osimertinib, which would be the standard, and then the third arm of lazertinib. We did see a comparison of lazertinib and osimertinib pre uh, presented at the World Lung Meeting that showed those curves really do overlap. And so uh, the difference between mariposa and osimertinib is not the lazertinib part. Really, we would think of that pretty similar to osimertinib. 
But adding imivantamab significantly improved progression-free survival, leading to uh, its FDA approval, as you mentioned, August 2024. In this update at ESMO, uh, what we looked at, which I thought was very interesting, was the patterns of resistance. You know, what? Uh, now that we have multiple regimens available in the frontline setting, Mariposa, which is imivantamab and lazertinib, uh, Flora 2, which is osimertinib plus chemotherapy, and Flora, which is osimertinib alone, we're starting to wonder which one should we use? What's the optimal sequence for a given patient? And understanding the resistance and how that impacts later therapy is important because we're not making just a decision on our treatment today. We want to see how it impacts everything going forward. And so we really want to understand resistance. And one might expect that if we're giving amivantamab this whole time, we're really shutting down EGFR and MET mediated resistance, which is a large portion of osimertinib related resistance. And, you know, in, indeed, Professor Benjamin Best, when he presented these, showed exactly that. We saw the rate of MET amplification went from 14% down to 4%. We saw the EGFR secondary resistance mutations from 8% to less than 1%. And so it's doing what we, what we expected it to do. It's nice to see. You know, one wonders if these cases that broke through are these cases where we had dose reductions, dose holds, or discontinuation of amivant. I think that would be pretty interesting. Um, what we also saw in this that I thought was really important going forward was that resistance after mariposa seemed to be less complex. What I mean by that is, you know, when we're treating someone with osimertinib, at the time of progression, when we check, we may see med amplification, we may see a second EGFR mutation, but very often a second EGFR mutation will occur in the context of many other things. And if we have a population of 100 cells, and there are 20 different mechanisms of resistance. It's kind of like spinning plates. It's hard to focus on one because you lose control over here. And so we need something that works for everything. Here with Mariposa, it seemed like there were less resistance mechanisms in any given patient. And so suggesting that maybe there's less polyclonal resistance, that maybe resistance is a little simpler, and one might extrapolate from that, that it might be easier to treat. Of course, it needs to be proven, but I think pieces are starting to align and we're starting to get a little bit more sophisticated. Thanks for summarizing that. And it's exactly right that how we saw these results, it was sort of expected, but it was nice to see that work out in practice here in this trial. Now, as you stated, Flora, Flora 2, and Mariposa. Now, how are you deciding when you are seeing your next patient? Does CTDNA positivity plays or affects your decision here, whether OC versus chemo, along with uh, ME LAS? You know, I think a lot of the subset data that we've seen from all of these studies has been more prognostic than predictive. And I haven't seen a compelling marker that says this person is specifically going to benefit. But to me, what, what is still missing is overall survival. Uh, because I think the question is not, should I give chemotherapy and osimertinib or osimertinib alone? It's, should I give chemotherapy and osimertinib versus osimertinib followed by chemotherapy? Really, that sequence, I think, is important. Right. Because if the survival is exactly the same, all I've done with these combinations is increase the time on infusions, increase toxicity. Nobody wants that. Indeed. And so Indeed. I really think that, that the survival is the, the, the big piece that's missing. And while we're talking about Mariposa, I think it's also important to at least reiterate that there was increased risk of blood clots that we have to mm -hmm. keep in mind. With amivantamab, it's also important now to consider prophylactic steroids till we wait for sub-Q infusion availability based off skipper data that was presented at World Lung by Gilberto Lopez. Talking about sequencing, here we uh, at ESMO also saw updated data on Mariposa 2, where we have amivantamab with chemotherapy in second line. And this whole idea of sequencing, should it be osimertinib, then adding chemotherapy, and then bringing amivantamab thereafter? Stephen, Mariposa 2, what did this study show, and when are you planning to use this? Well, in this study, another three-armed study, patients who had already had osimertinib were randomized to chemotherapy, which is the standard, or chemotherapy plus amivantamab, or chemotherapy plus amivantamab and lazertinib. Now, that arm, where you had ami plus laser plus chemo, we thought we might need the lazertinib to maintain CNS control. That was not the case. The CNS control was better with amivantamab, and lazertinib didn't really seem to, to add much there. That did increase the risk for venous thromboembolic disease, though. And so that risk of blood clots really is the combination of amivantamab and lazertinib, not amivantamab chemotherapy. And so that arm with amivantamab, lazertinib chemotherapy is not the, the Mariposa 2 arm that's moving forward. It's the amivantamab plus chemotherapy arm that we really reached to. And what it showed is when you add amivantamab, you significantly improve progression-free survival, and there is a strong trend towards overall survival. Now, with this update at Desmo 2024 from Dr. Sanjay Papat, what we saw was 
the trend for overall survival continues. These curves split pretty quickly after about four or five months, and it's maintained, maybe even widened a little bit. We see it a year and a half, 40% survival rate versus 50%. I suspect this will become significant. It is not yet significant. That doesn't mean it's a negative trial. This is an interim planned analysis. These are event-driven, and so the study will continue to mature. I'm willing to, to bet this will be positive. And I think this really uh, uh, is, a, is an appealing regimen after osimertinib because uh, it is quite effective here. Now, it does you know, add toxicity to chemotherapy. We have imivantamab-related toxicities, uh, primarily dermatologic. Uh, in nature, the infusion reactions. You talked about the skipper data, which I think is important. But to me, the Mariposa 2 regimen, I would consider to be uh, uh, probably the, the best practice after osimertinib. As you're talking about uh, the practice changing, the important one here from small cell lung cancer space, which has been in fact a success story after a long time, is Adriatic Study. Another plenary discussion from ASCO 2024, where Durvalumab was used as a consolidation therapy in limited stage small cell lung cancer, which demonstrated PFS and overall survival benefit. Here at ESMO 2024, we saw further updates based off of PCI outcomes in these patients. Stephen, can you please walk us through the study design and the recent update? here. Sure. This is a study for patients with limited stage small cell lung cancer. So disease that can be encompassed in one tolerable radio thrust, radiation port. Patients completed chemo radiation first, then were enrolled in Adriatic. And so the design mirrors Pacific. Uh, they were randomized to receive Durvalumab or placebo, and then a third arm of Durvalumab plus the CTLA-4 inhibitor Tremolimumab that hasn't been reported yet. And what we showed was that adding Durvalumab significantly improved progression-free survival and overall survival. Now, the hazard ratio is actually pretty similar to what we see in extensive stage, but the absolute improvement, instead of being two months, it was two years. And so uh, seeing that profound impact tells us we want to identify these earlier, and really Durvalumab has become, I think, best practice standard of care after chemo radiation. These are phenomenal results. But because it's a very heterogeneous population up until enrollment, there were some questions. Patients could receive a, a lot of different types of therapy before they enrolled. Uh, the question that uh, Professor Suresh Senan presented at, at ESMO is, did those things impact the benefit of Durvalumab? For example, patients could have received once daily radiation or twice daily radiation. Uh, was one of those in particular, did we see more benefit from Durva? Uh, and really what we saw is all the subgroups, however you got to the point of completing uh, chemo radiation, whether you had once daily or twice daily radiation, whether you had prophylactic cranial radiation or not, and whether you had cisplatin or carboplatin, Durvalumab delivered pretty similar benefit. Now the absolute benefit, the absolute survival numbers at least, were greater for those who had PCI. Now, this study wasn't designed to really show the benefit of PCI, and the reality is patients who were given PCI were younger, better performance status, uh, and really it may be selection bias. And I think the same is true for twice daily versus once daily radiation. We've fallen in these patterns before where we uh, overreach and really assume that it's from the intervention, when really it's because of the reasons they were given that intervention. What was interesting, though, is that the carboplatin arm seemed to do better than the cisplatin, which we weren't expecting, which goes against all the other studies we've seen. And again, I wouldn't make too much of that. Uh, right now, regardless of how you complete your treatment for limited stage small cell lung cancer, Durvalumab really should be offered afterwards. Uh, and really, this is the right approach, giving Durvalumab after the radiation. At Astro 2024, we did see that LU005 showed that you know giving atezolizumab with radiation, with concurrent chemo radiation, uh, was not beneficial. Pacific 2, giving Durvalumab with concurrent chemo radiation, not beneficial. Wait till the radiation's done, let people recover, and then begin the immunotherapy. Stephen, thank you so much for touching on that. A few things to reiterate. Multiple studies, including just the data, as you've mentioned from yesterday at Astro, concurrent immunotherapy with radiation, higher toxicities, and most of these studies are indeed negative. Coming back to Adriatic, do you think this is going to change your practice where you're still leaning into PCI a little more in limited stage, or the data is not convincing enough where you feel just consolidated um, immunotherapy is good enough in these patients? Yeah, it's a, a great question, and I think there's still equipoise to ask that question, but to me, these data don't show that. Really, those decisions were made before, and uh, when we look at the demographics for both twice daily and PCI, clearly the patients were younger, had better performance status. That alone can really explain the differences here. Uh, what we need are prospective studies, but fortunately, there are two ongoing. In the U.S., the Maverick study being run through the cooperative groups will help answer that question. In Europe, the Prima Lung study run by the URTC will help answer that question. So those data will need to convince me. To me, the burden really is on showing that there is benefit because there is significant cost. And when we think of patients that we're curing, 
And we're, we're curing more people now with Dervalimab here. Uh, if we're cured of their small cell, but leaving them with dementia or significant neurocognitive effects from radiation that maybe didn't provide benefit, I think that'd be quite quite a tragedy. So to me, I think there is still a question to be asked. I do not think it's wrong to deliver PCI, but I also don't think it's wrong to observe with MRI. It's discussion with our patients. I'm really, this is a patient-centered and we, we just need a little bit more perspective data in the MRI era. Exciting times. Stephen, thank you so much for this comprehensive review. These studies are truly shaping the future of lung cancer treatment. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap from this discussion. In today's discussion with Dr. Stephen Liu, we've covered key abstracts both in non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer from ESMO 2024. Also, Mertineb in unresectable stage 3 EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer is the new standard of care after concurrent chemo radiation. We've also touched on the recent updates and approvals of Emivantamab based off Mariposa and Mariposa 2 data. Finally, in limited states, most of lung cancer, Dervalimab for two years is now in fact the standard of care after concurrent chemo radiation. Make sure to also check out our GI, GU, and breast cancer highlights from ESMO 2024. We are the Oncology Brothers.